The best theory about the beast's fatal head wound is the one that nobody talks about. Now, Revelation 13 tells us the beast suffers a fatal head wound, and everyone has assumed this just means the Antichrist. But is that correct? We have a really interesting subject that we're gonna discuss this week, and we're going to talk about what exactly the scriptures mean when they talk about the beast in Revelation. Is it a, a man? Is the beast an empire? Is the beast a demon? Or is it all three? I'll tell you what I think and what this all means and what we should be looking for. This is Bible teacher Nelson Walters. And if we're correct about the tribulation beginning on October 2nd, then we'd also be saying the beast is going to arise within the next three and a half years. And this is just huge. So we need to know as much as we can about what to watch for because it's going to happen very soon if we're right. So let's dig into the biblical narrative, Revelation 13, 1 through 2. It says the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. The dragon is Satan, so he's overseeing what's happening. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns are ten crowns, or diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were those of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. So first, let's try to picture this scene. We have Satan, who is depicted as a reptilian dragon standing on the shore of the sea and he's watching his great protege, the beast, come out of the sea. So let's start. What's the sea? We discussed this in a previous video. In Revelation 17, we know the beast comes up out of the abyss or the bottomless pit. That's also mentioned in Revelation 11. Here we see it coming out of the sea. The abyss is frequently referred to as the deepest part of the ocean. So that seems to work here. Satan sees the beast coming up out of the abyss. Well, what does that mean? Who or what is in the abyss? The term abyss in scripture refers to a holding area for demons and fallen angels. Not people, not empires. So that pretty much narrows down who this beast is. And if you haven't noticed, this is almost never discussed. If he comes out of the abyss, he is a demon or fallen angel who has been imprisoned there. That doesn't mean there isn't an empire and that doesn't mean there isn't a human king. But the beast in his essence is a demon or a fallen angel. It has the most unusual appearance too. It's a chimera. Part this animal, part that. We read it is predominantly a leopard, but it has the mouth of a lion and the feet of a bear. It has a number of heads, 10 horns, and it's scarlet, which in ancient Israel was a color made from a bug and has kind of an orangish red hue to it. And it has blasphemous names written on those heads. Wow, when you hear all that, you can understand why scholars have struggled with what this is. Let's look at it part by part. It has 10 horns and 10 diadems or kingly crowns that are on these horns. When it arises, it already has 10 horns. They're already formed. It's not like the beast comes up out of the abyss and then the horns form. The horns form first. Revelation 17 says this about the horns. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. That's Revelation 17, 12-13. So the horns are ten kings. In this previous video, we go over who the ten horns are in detail. There are several clues. They aren't kings now, but they will become kings when the beast assumes power. This somewhat further implies that their kingdom or kingdoms haven't formed yet either, that they're going to form 
when the beast takes power. This implies we may not know them yet, and it says they are of one mind with the beast. This verse is a major clue as to their identity because that verse is not only found in Revelation, it's also found in Psalm 83 in regard to 10 people groups that surround Israel. 10 horns are of one mind, 10 people groups in Psalm 83 are of one mind, so we believe that 10 kings will come from these 10 people groups around Israel. And they are not yet a kingdom, but our best guess is these people form a single country around Israel with 10 leaders. Next are the seven heads, and these are very important because it's one of these heads that appears to be slain. Seven of them, one of them slain. Let's look at the passage in Revelation 13, 2-4. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads seemed to have had a mortal wound. Notice it's only one of the heads. It has seven, but only one appears to have this mortal wound. But its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Now, the most common opinion among scholars is that the Antichrist is that head. Satan's vessel to accomplish his purposes in the last days, and that this man will be killed. He will suffer a fatal wound. He'll be shot in the head, he'll be hit in the head with a missile, something will happen to his head, or maybe a drone, whatever it might be. He's going to die, and then he'll be resurrected from the dead. So, as it's popularly taught, Satan will essentially imitate Jesus, rising from the dead, and as a result of this resurrection, the whole earth will be amazed and they're going to follow and worship the Antichrist. That's the popular theory. So if we're going to test this theory, because we got to test it, right? You can't just accept it. We need to look at what the Bible says about the beast and his heads, because Satan has these same seven heads. This explanation is found in Revelation 17, 9 through 11. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Mountain is a term the Bible uses for a kingdom on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings. So there are seven kingdoms associated with seven kings. But we aren't sure yet that they're human kings. John continues his description. Five of whom have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, or in other words, it's one of the first seven heads, and it goes to destruction. So the beast, which comes out of the abyss, which we now know is a demonic holding place for fallen angels, because only fallen angels or demons can be in the abyss, that the beast is one of these first seven heads. That answers our question about what kind of kings these heads are. It has to be a supernatural head, a supernatural king. The seven kings are supernatural kings. So if the beast is a supernatural fallen angel, and he's one of the first seven, they are all supernatural fallen angels. It also tells us he was the supernatural king of one of the first five empires. How can we say that? Well, at the time John wrote this, the beast was historically to John. It, it happened in the past before John. Is not, so it was in the abyss already. So it couldn't have been Rome because Rome was ruling at that time. And it's going to come back and go to destruction. Who were those first five then? Babel or Babylon, Egypt, Assyria, Persia, and Greece. You'll notice that this eliminates all the popular choices from scholars today. It eliminates all the choices. Rome, it was the sixth head, it wasn't one of the first five. Islam, Germany, or the globalist UN empire that's currently forming. One of these three would probably be the seventh head. So that's pretty amazing. 
all the popular modern choices of scholars are eliminated by looking at this verse critically. It's not Rome, it's not Islam, it's not Germany. Now that doesn't mean that elements from Europe or the Middle East can't be involved. They can be involved in that empire. But according to Revelation 17, it isn't a revived Roman, Islamic, or Nazi empire. So I imagine you'd agree with our title to this point. This is the best theory about the beast's head wound that nobody, absolutely nobody, is talking about. No one else is going where we're about to go. No one else is teaching this, yet it's 100% biblical, as you can see from our explanation. So we have five possibilities for the head that receives the fatal wound. Babylon, Egypt, Syria, Persia, and Greece. Which one is it? Well, this is a pretty hard choice. They all received fatal head wounds and were all replaced by the next empire. And there are scriptures that would support any one of these five because God uses these empires as types or symbols of what the final beast empire will be like. However, let's read the passage about the beast from Revelation 13 to carefully now that we know it's one of these five and see if we can find a clue. The beast which I saw was like a leopard. That's a pretty big clue. And his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. These animals that are chosen here are not random. They come from Daniel 7 and Daniel's vision of the four great beasts. Most scholars believe these beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and the fourth terrifying beast are equivalent to the four medals of Nebuchadnezzar's dream statue of four medals, gold, silver, bronze, iron. And these animals are the ancient empires of Babylon, the lion, Persia, the bear, and Greece, the leopard. If you didn't notice, the beast is said to be an amalgamation of these three, like a leopard with the mouth of a lion and the feet of a bear, but it's primarily a leopard. Like we said, is that a clue? I'd say it absolutely has to be a big clue. And I think you'll be amazed when you see where this is going. The Greek Empire was the empire of Alexander the Great. It reached from Macedonia in the Northwest all the way to India. Here is a map of Alexander's empire. Will the beast empire match this footprint? Maybe. It's said to be like a leopard after all. Upon his death, Alexander's empire was split among his generals known as the Diadochi. First into two dozen pieces, then five pieces, and finally into two main empires, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Why is this important? That sounds like a lot of history. Well, this is interesting because the greatest foreshadow of the Antichrist in history comes from this Seleucid Empire. He is called Antiochus IV Epiphanes. This is a man who invaded Israel killed Israelites for practicing their religion, took away their sacrifices, and set up an early version of the Abomination of Desolation, a statue of Zeus, in the temple, on the Temple Mount. Yes, the same kind of things the Antichrist is going to do. Wow, think about that. We have a former empire that featured a leader who matches the Antichrist action for action. And it was like a leopard just like the beast is like a leopard. So when we think about what the head was that received the fatal wound, doesn't it make sense that it was the Greek head, the Greek empire, the prince of Greece, you know, the demonic leader of the empire. Daniel even mentions this individual, the prince of Greece in Daniel 10, 20. This is a messenger angel speaking to Daniel. But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. So this angel is describing spiritual warfare, him fighting against these demonic fallen angels, and one of them is the one we have that we think might be coming back, the prince of Greece. But the word in Hebrew is Yevon. Yes, the same Yevon found in Daniel 8 
and the prophecy of the ram and the goat. I told you, you would be amazed, especially because in Daniel 8, 17 through 19, we're told three times, this prophecy about the ram and the goat is about the time of the end, the final indignation or wrath, and the appointed time of the end. So Yevon specifically returns in the end times. And if you didn't notice, Persia does too, because Persia is the ram in this prophecy. So when Revelation 13 speaks of a head wound of the beast, doesn't it make sense that it was Yevon, who is a leopard, and the demonic prince of Yevon that Revelation is talking about here? But what about the Antichrist? You haven't said a word about the Antichrist. Does he receive a fatal head wound as well? Is he revived? The answer is maybe, possibly. We know the worthless shepherd of Zechariah 11:17 is wounded in his eye and in his arm. So it can be both, but do yourself a favor. Do this exercise. Take every verse in Revelation, where the word beast appears and ask yourself, does this better fit with a man or a demonic creature? I think you'll find that exercise interesting. But there is no doubt that Yevon and Persia are returning in the end times, as we find in Daniel 8. In fact, this is the scripture that describes how the little horn or antichrist comes to power. Click right here to keep watching and learn the events that may happen as soon as this year or maybe next as our world hurdles toward the coming Antichrist. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.